we have a tradition of like watching Scrooge on the TV and him kind of, you know, snuggled up with me. That's and, the... Uh, the George C. Scott version, oh. which is our favorite, our family favorite. Uh, it's a pretty good one. There's also a Bill Murray one, right? <laughs> yes, there's... Yeah. Oh, wait, Scrooged. Oh, which so is this we different? watched right, but we did watch that right after because that's a comedy. Okay, so yours is just Scrooge. Just no it's D. a Christmas Carol. It's oh, just a Christmas Carol. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I think gotcha. we just say Scrooge for short. Welcome to TBC Extra, a weekly podcast of our Sunday sermon and a little extra. I am Teresa Jenkins, the communications director here at Topeka Bible Church. And I'm Jason Brent, the children's pastor at Topeka Bible Church, and we're glad you're here. Now, for a little extra. Welcome to the first episode of 2023. Hi, Alan. Hey. Happy Happy New New Year. Year. Whoa, Jinx. Jinx. (laughs) Or at our house, as we say, Jenkins. Oh, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, <laughs> this this table. I should have taken my my mug off. This table is how our house will look. For those of you who are listening, we have a barren table in the studio. Yep. With just three mic stands, this is how our house is going to look next week. How it's going to feel after we take down all the Christmas decorations. Oh yeah, we for the first time ever uh, had like a I, or I guess for me put up like a full tree by my well not by myself with my girlfriend yes and as like a new adult if that makes sense it was my first time doing that and so I'm kind of sad that we'll probably have to put it down here pretty soon <laughs> it sound like shoot a, it? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm putting down a pet no so yeah it's just kind of a bummer because we worked really hard putting out the lights and the ornaments yeah it's a lot like of that. work that's I mean we leave it up I was raised Catholic and we always left them up through the epiphany which I think is roughly dis, uh, January 6th ish oh, okay uh, it's like 12 days after Christmas um that might be wrong, but that's what my recollection is. I would not know <laughs> and um so we would leave that up and that's when you know, symbolically the wise men came it wasn't 12 oh. days after but that's when the catholic church huh. celebrates it uh, so that we don't have christmas and then two and a half years later we have the wise men show up which is probably closer to when it actually was i feel like i should have heard of this before but i i have not okay so that's like cool. as connor was saying during the, the christmas eve service to have the wise men as part of the nativity mm-hmm. when jesus is a newborn it's not really not accurate. accurate. I knew that. I didn't know that but the, the, Ca- yeah, the Catholic Catholics Church did celebrates the Epiphany. Oh. So uh, anyway, it has nothing to do with this week's Absolutely sermon. Absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> but this is extra, and that is often what you get when you watch or listen to extra. Mm-hmm. But this week, Connor did continue our First Corinthians series, and he talked about spiritual gifts, not in the way some people might have thought. In fact, he gave us like a little teaser that that's not going to be exactly what you think. He talked about the context of how to use those gifts, which I really appreciate. So we'll get that yeah. to to that in a few minutes. But I wanted to ask you, because we're kind of talking about gifts. What? Give me uh, the lowdown on like a memorable gift or a special gift. Like ever this or this year, last? For oh, just this, this Christmas. Like Christmas. Yeah. Well, it's for me, it's kind of weird because I am a December birthday so I kind of get that weird uh, birthday being close to yeah. Christmas, like which gift is for what. Like in the past, oftentimes I would get a larger gift that was birthday and Christmas kind of combined. Nah. And my mom would have fun <laughs> and like split the wrapping paper up or like Christmas on one oh, side. Oh, that's kind of fun. And she had a good time with it, but that'd be like game console, like level. Oh, sure. Big things. And I kind of would uh, coerce them into doing that because I wanted So you didn't mind the bigger gift. No, I did not mind it because otherwise it'd be like smaller things. Per, yes. Yeah, which is what it was this year, but like in a good way um, because now I'm an adult and can just buy my own game consoles. Yes. <laughs> so I got like a lot of records, uh, which I'm a record collector. So that was really, really cool. Um, and then even there's like cardigan, a lot of clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's always good when Christmas comes around cause it kind of spruces up my wardrobe. So Understood. good stuff. It was a lot of cool stuff. What about good, you? Good. Um, I got to spend time with my son. He lives in Leavenworth and, uh, my only thing I wanted for Christmas was really him to come home and, and have it. We have a tradition of like watching Scrooge on the TV and him kind of, you know, snuggled up with me That's and the, uh, the George C. Scott version, uh, which is our favorite, our family favorite. Uh, it's a pretty good one. There's also a Bill Murray one, right? <laughs> yes. There's, yeah. oh, wait, Scrooged. Oh, which so is this we different? watched right, but we did watch that right after because that's a comedy. Okay. So yours is just Scrooge. Just, no it's D. a Christmas Carol. It's oh, just a Christmas Carol. Okay. 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 Yeah. 
I think gotcha. we just say Scrooge for short. But uh, and then we watch Scrooged, which is not family friendly. Immediately after that, the okay. Bill Murray one. But yeah, so parents, I got to have that experience with him, yeah. and that was that was wonderful. Yeah, my parents are also a watch Christmas Carol every year. Do you have a certain people. version? Um, I don't know which one they watch because there's a lot out there. There are. Uh, it is one of the older ones, like probably from like the fifties. I don't nice. know that for certain, but it's an old one, and I I do like it. Uh, it means a classic story. The Alistair Sim one, which is from around that time period, maybe even a little earlier. Also, Black and White is also one of my favorites. So. Yeah, this the one I'm thinking of is Black and White, so maybe, it could maybe be. it's the same, it one. the same one. So your gift was him spending time with you, yes. gift of company. Yes, and we That's got to do nice. that. And then I went, I mentioned in staff meeting today, we went door dashing after, well, the next day on uh, the 26th because he does that as a part-time side hustle and... Uh, you learn a lot about the world of door dashing, getting to ride alongside my son. Yeah. I never got into that, but I had roommates that did. And I believe my older brother did for a while uh, or Uber eats, I think is what yeah. they did. It was eye opening. Yeah. I so bet. my gifts and my eyes were opened. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you all had a great Christmas and a happy new year. Uh, shall we go ahead and get to the sermon? Let's do it. Let's do it. to see you. Um, So I have a confession to make to you, which is that I am going to tease you this morning. And um, it's a confession because I don't I don't like being teased that often. Um, But also, I'm somebody who likes to set likes to set expectations very clearly. And so I'm going to tell you how I'm going to tease you. Therefore, when we arrive there, you don't you aren't as upset. Okay. So we're, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 12. That's what we're going through this morning. And uh, the entire subject of 1 Corinthians 12 is spiritual gifts. Okay. Now, the tease part is that we are not going to walk through every single spiritual gift and talk about what it means. Because when you combine all of the different passages... Um, and I'll explain more about this later. But when you combine all the different passages about spiritual gifts... Our list is nearing 20, okay? And so we're not, we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about what I think Paul wants us to understand in this chapter, which is why. Why do we talk about spiritual gifts? And if you don't know what those are, we'll get to that too, no sweat. But the greater question here is what are they and what is the purpose behind them? That's really what we're endeavoring to figure out today. So if you will, but that is the tease. Okay, I've already let you know, so no tomatoes thrown later. Um, So if you will, let's go ahead and move to verse 1 in chapter 12. And Paul begins here, and he says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So the first thing we have to look at here is is in that first verse, right? He says, "I, I don't want you to be uninformed, right? We have to remember here that what we're about to get into in chapter 12 is basically a response to a response. 1 Corinthians is not the first letter that Paul sent to that church. He sent them a letter. They sent him something back. And what we have as 1 Corinthians is his response to their return letter. And so that is why sometimes in this, uh, this letter, we have Paul just sort of jumping into topics that don't always seem to have a, a preamble or an introduction. 
That's the case here, right? And so he's, somehow they have asked him, or for some reason they have asked him about spiritual gifts and what to do with it in their local church, and we're going to see hints of that as we kind of keep going. But as we walk into this whole chapter, though, we have to recognize that the themes that Paul is drawing out are relevant to Corinth, but also to us. So he says, you know that when you were pagans, meaning those who right, worshipped false gods, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, or otherwise, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So a problem in the Corinthian church that we talked about is they were very prideful. They were very gifted. Chapter one, or chapter one tells us that. They had a lot of good things going for them, uh, but they liked to put a lot of praise on themselves for how well they were doing, right? And so the Corinthian church, they were boastful, they were prideful, they loved their own, and they basically loved to hear themselves talk. That would be a good summary of the Corinthian church. And so when we're talking about them, he's, he's setting the stage for something that we're going to look at in a second, which he says, listen, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't say Jesus be cursed, right? pagans, or if you say, if you are somebody who says Jesus is Lord, the only way you could be saying that, the most basic function of being a Christian, right, calling upon the name of the Lord is by the power of the Spirit. And so there's nothing that you're doing, dear Corinth, right, that is amazing that is without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he kind of brings them in at ground level and he says, right, every single thing that you are doing that is good and glorifying and wonderful and you're praising that is for Jesus, he says, it is the Holy Spirit who empowers you to do it. And once we start at that level, then we can, then we can talk about spiritual gifts here, right? And then he brings up the other theme that we're going to discuss this morning, which is diversity. There are different kinds of gifts Right? There are different kinds of service, and in each one, it's the same Spirit, it's the same Lord. Like I said, we'll get to that in a moment, but suffice to say for now, the Corinthians also had a problem with favoring some of these spiritual gifts more than others. So now let's take an aside here and say, if we don't know what spiritual gifts are, let's tackle that real quick. Spiritual gifts, not to be crude, are like Christian superpowers, okay? They are things that the, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all right? The Holy Spirit, which is God himself, dwells within you, and that Holy Spirit has given gifts, special kind of manifestations of skill and passions and abilities onto Christians for a specific purpose, which we'll also get to in a moment. But spiritual gifts, as we're talking about them here, right? this word, gifts, the word in Greek is charismata, which is where we get our word for charisma. Charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, is the word for grace in Greek. And so when we are talking about gifts that the Spirit gives to us, they can be literally translated as grace gifts. If you haven't gotten the message so far, everything good that comes through us is from Jesus. It is from the Holy Spirit, okay? And every single gift that the Corinthians have is a word that we might be a little unfamiliar with using, but all of them are charismatic, right? Now that describes sort of, you know, a denomination and activities of certain churches, but every gift of the Spirit is charismatic, it is something, it is a gift of grace by God, and people are gifted differently, but everyone is gifted. Did anyone ever used to watch Oprah when she was on? Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> My mom used to watch Oprah all the time. Do you remember when she gave everybody a car? Yeah, I remember this episode. Um, it was a big deal, Oprah. Apparently, none of you have watched Oprah. She was a talk show host for a long time. <laughs> Big deal. And she used to give out gifts to people in her audience. Well, one day she gives everybody in her audience a car. Okay, and it was a big thing because previously she had never given such a large gift to any one person who wasn't on stage, and then every single person who was sitting in the audience received a car. Okay, and so she has this famous line, you should look it up, where she's like, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. The only time I'll ever compare the Holy Spirit to Oprah 
But all Christians have received gifts from the Holy Spirit. This is, it's kind of an enveloping measure where we recognize that if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're included in this conversation, okay? Maybe you don't know your spiritual gifts to the greatest extent. Maybe you haven't exercised them. Maybe this is new information. But if you know Jesus, you said, hey, he died on the cross for my sins. I've trusted in him. He rose on the third day. We're good to go. Then you have been given at least a gift and probably gifts, grace gifts, from the Holy Spirit. But as we keep going, though, we'll see that there's some nuance here. Verse 7, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given, here's the tease part, to one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of these tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So the first thing for us to notice here is verse 7 where Paul basically gives his thesis, his main idea, which is he says, now to each one the Spirit has been given, and it has been given, as he says, for the common good. That is the purpose of the Holy Spirit's gifts to every single Christian. It is for the common good, okay? Now, if I could implant into you, into your mind, one sort of seed or idea that can develop over time, it is that when we consider Topeka Bible Church, right, and some of you Mulvane crowd are in cab for, you know, only like the second or third time in your life, and we've got different services, we've got two different buildings, but if you can see everything that we do as one body, you are going to do well as we move forward and talk about how that one body works together, right? And you need to see this body, believe me, because Paul's going to talk about that body in a second, but it's not just individuals who are coming into a room to hear somebody talk. That we are sort of an institution ordained by God for the Great Commission and that every single person plays a role in this mission, but also that the power that we have been given to be able to accomplish that mission mission was given by the Spirit, and the purpose of our spiritual gifts is then to benefit others. So there are some people who use their spiritual gifts, right, whatever they might be, for their own means and their own purposes. Perhaps somebody, as an example, is gifted in speaking and they've used that successfully in their career, whatever it is, but have neglected to use that for other people. There are many ways that this cuts across the whole thing, but the purpose of our spiritual gifts is to benefit others, and the context, like the, the area where we do that, is within the local church. So when we talk about all these gifts, right, I said, I know, this is the tease part. If you collect a whole bunch of them, not all of these are in 1 Corinthians. There's four main places in the New Testament where they're talked about, okay? You get a big list. Here's the reason why we're not going through them one by one, okay? A, I have a short amount of time. B, probably more, more importantly, is the fact that in any of these four passages, um, it only a section of this list is presented, which tells us that these spiritual gifts are not constrained to this list, but rather that instead, Paul, as in 1 Corinthians, is like, these are the gifts that I see within your congregation. These are the ways that the Spirit has manifested himself in what you're doing, and this is what I recognize in you, right? And so he does it with the Romans and the Ephesians, and then Peter talks about this a little bit, and each one of them makes it relevant to their people. So what does that tell us? Right? Well, it tells us that when Paul then in verse 8 begins to talk about all of these things, it's things that he sees in the Corinthians. And so it's actually not particularly helpful for us to walk through every single one of these because they were the gifts manifesting themselves in Corinth. But before we move past that, I do just want to acknowledge one more time how many times he says, hey, where does this come from? Where, where are we getting all these gifts, right? 
Who is doing this? It is by the power of the Spirit. And in verse 11, now he's, going to, he's done telling them, right, that it is God that does all the amazing things. It is not them who are super special, but it is the Lord himself. Now we're moving on to a different theme. Okay, new topic. Verse 11, he distributes them to each one just as he determines, right? There is diversity, and then it is all given by the same God. There is a multitude of gifts. We just looked at a list, and there are more than that, all coming from the same Spirit. Um, And so in verse 12, now he gets into this image of a body. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So, the diversity of gifts is what makes the body strong. Just as a body, though one has many parts, all its many parts form the one body. And so what we see here is that the differences in background, race, gender, hobbies, interests, skills, financial status, age, uh, auditorium that you go to, right? Whatever it is, all of these things come together We are all different parts of the body, and yet we come together as one. And that's going to be really important here in a second because Paul is going to list some problems that come about when we are trying to accomplish that mission, when the disparate, when the diverse comes together under Christ. I mean, think about this. He gives two groups, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free people. Those are very different groups of people, yet... He says, under Jesus Christ, they can come together. Perhaps nowhere else in the culture can those four groups of people intermingle with one another. But he says, when they're under Jesus, when they're in the house of worship, when they're focused on their God, he says, well, then they are one body. Staggering statement. Same thing is true for us today. We can find this unity in the body, and we celebrate the diversity of it. But as Paul is going to say, there are a couple problems that we run into, that the Corinthians ran into, and chances are we do as well here in Topeka. So as we move on, he says in verse 15, now if the foot should say, he's going to list different body parts, okay? It's going to sound like some weird fable. Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, what a weird image, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, even weirder, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. So there are two um, general problems that come up here with the diverse becoming one, all right? The first one is in verses 15 through 16 there, right? And he's, he's sort of, <laughs> I don't know how he determined it, but the idea is he is listing a part of the body that is not as important, i.e. the hand in this case, and he is giving it a voice as it is comparing itself to one who is more important, Right, this is the problem We've, we talked about a little bit in Corinth is that they were lifting themselves up higher They were saying that some of them were more important than others because of the spiritual gifts that they had. In particular, in Corinth, it was that they were speaking in tongues. That's something that he's going to talk about throughout 12, 13, and 14. But nevertheless, they were lifting up some of them higher than others, okay? So we have this problem that was going on, and he's using an analogy, is that some people who, in this case, apparently couldn't speak in tongues were looking at the ones who did, and they were saying, well, if I can't do that, then I must not be a part of the church. Or if I can't do that, then what's the point in me even trying? So the problem there is that the diversity is not appreciated. Something that we're going to hit on in just a moment, but that God placed them just as he wanted them to be. 
Remember, it is a work of the Spirit that gives every single one of you your spiritual gifts. It's not something that you're deserving of praise for, nor is it something that we get fussy about because God in his sovereignty has decided, he said, okay, hey, this church to work together to be a full, complete body that is healthy needs to have a lot of different parts to it, and so I'm going to distribute them how I will, and there's no need for the lesser to look to the greater. I remember when I was working down in Fort Worth, there was a guy named um, Arch who... I think in my life, I've encountered two people where very, very obviously they had the spiritual gift of evangelism. And this guy, I would, I worked with him and I, we would, I remember one time we got together there's a, they have one in Lawrence now, Torchy's Taco Shop. They're everywhere down in Texas. And, uh, he was like, yeah, you know, I was, I was meeting some people at Torchy's and I was ordering my food and I could just tell that the guy who was taking my order needed to hear about Jesus and I led him to Christ. And I was like, goodness sakes. <laughs> like, there was absolutely a level of comparison that was going on there selfishly where I was like, that would never be me, right? And my goodness, you know, I, when I go to Torchy's, my last thought is, is this person need to know the gift of the cross? So here would be the problem, though, is then if I said one of two things, either A, then my gift of evangelism, which I'm not entirely sure that I possess, but then that gift that I shouldn't use it, okay, that I, that I shouldn't because it's not as good as the person who is so obviously gifted in that way that I should remove myself from the body, that I should not attempt to still use the gift that God had given, even though it is perhaps, if we want to use this word, slightly lesser, okay? God has manifested gifts in different amounts and different abilities. So that would be one problem, is if I said, well, because I'm not as, as talented as that person by the gift of the Spirit, then I should disengage, The other problem, though, that I would have is if I said, well, because they are so talented, I'm going to leave the entire job of evangelism up to them. I'm not going to engage in it, right? See, there are things that we've been called to do as Christians that we are supposed to do regardless of our abilities, You're supposed to share the gospel with people. You're supposed to give. You're supposed to be a good neighbor. You are supposed to live with mercy. You are supposed to live like Jesus Christ, And no amount of spiritual gift or lack thereof sort of removes that responsibility from us. And so even though I am certainly not as gifted as Arch, well, that doesn't mean that I still have not been called to share the gospel with people and to evangelize. So there are problems when we develop this level of envy by comparison and we start to make determinations about ourselves based upon other people, which is not where our focus should be right? You might, this works generally with any single team event. You can talk about ballet. You can talk about doing a Shakespearean play. You can talk about an orchestra, playing a piece by Bach. You can talk about a football team. You can talk about, but when we are talking about a play or a musical, okay, we think about the fact that we all have a part to play, but not everybody plays the same part. And If everybody played the same part, it would not be a very good musical. (laughs) Having said that, I think that particular musical is slightly overrated, and with that, I will move on. (laughs) So the other thing that I want you to look at here, though, is there's, right, Paul gives two problems. One is when we basically, with envy, compare ourselves to the greater, and we say, okay, I'm going to make a decision about what I do based upon that other person. Okay, that, that's not good. But the other thing, is what we just talked about, is now when we get this really weird image of the whole body becomes an eye, whole body becomes an ear, and Paul says, how sad is that? If we were to, and again, what he's digging at here is the Corinthians' desire, basically, that the best of us are the ones that can speak in tongues. And so everybody was desiring that. And he says, how lame would that be if the entire church only people spoke in tongues? He said, it would not accomplish any of the goals that God had set out for the church to do. And so in seeking similarity and constantly looking to be homogenous in the way that we um, express our gifts, he says the church becomes weaker. 
It's not as impactful as if we uh, embrace that diversity. So before we move on from this passage, I just want to direct your attention to that underlined portion one more time, where it says, but in fact, as a response to all of these things, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. And so I would offer that to you as a bit of encouragement. If you have ever felt like your spiritual gifts or you yourself without recognizing your gifts have not been a part of the body or you have felt excluded from the body, you should find encouragement in the fact that God has given you giftings according with his will and his grace for your own good and according to his purpose. And there's not a single one of you who should have a measure of shame or guilt about that, even if you perhaps struggle with comparison at times. God has placed you exactly where he wants you to be. But now, 21, we shift our focus. Okay, We were looking at the lesser to the greater. Now, now we're changing perspective. We're going from the greater to the lesser. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is, on, is honored, every part rejoices with it. So, like I said previously, our focus was on the less popular parts. Now, though, we are directing ourselves towards, if you will, like the final correction of the Corinthian church, which was the pride that Paul perceived in the way that they were treating certain people within the church. I've talked about this already, so I won't labor that point, but basically, they were prioritizing certain spiritual gifts above others. They weren't recognizing, A, that it all came from God, and B, that every single spiritual gift is necessary for the church to function well. So they were taking these things, and apparently that attitude moved all the way to this level where those who had these more appreciated spiritual gifts were looking at those, you know, hey, I have the gift of mercy, I have the gift of helps, I have the gift of administration, so on and so forth, less obvious gifts, and saying, you're not needed here. You don't, you don't need to be a part of what's going on. You're not a part of the church. Um, what you have needs to stay to the sidelines. And then Paul brings in this beautiful countercultural message, which I won't read all of it again, but it begins with, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. He says, you are going to uh, sort of hamstring yourself if you remove them from the church and if you act like they aren't important. I mean, where else but in the kingdom of God are the weak lifted up and made strong and are said that they will inherit the earth? That is only a kingdom mandate in God's world, is that those who think they are high will be brought low, and those who are low will be brought high. That is something that exists solely within God's power dynamic, something that we often fail to bring about in our own world. But here we're now bringing it into the church with how we relate to these things. And he says, now those people who we Again, recognize there's only really a few ways to discuss it, but have spiritual gifts that are seen as lesser or maybe more um, quiet roles within the church. That's probably a better way to say it. He said those people are the ones that should be lifted up on a pedestal. And those people who think they're so wonderful, they should perhaps be taken down a notch. There's some language that Paul uses here about parts of the body that we continue to recognize as unpresentable, and those are treated with special modesty. But he says, so that there is no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So here's what I think of when I read this passage, is I think of like Ken Maynard and his maintenance staff, or I think of Tom Green and his housekeeping staff here, who are either keeping this 100-year-old building running or cleaning this 100-year-old building, 
And I think of all of the things that are often attributed to those who have more front-facing roles and how little, is off, how little credit is often given you know, uh, during the Christmas Eve services where in between them, Tom was mopping the bathrooms as hundreds of people were flowing through. That does not happen, right? Our church does not succeed if we don't have not only people in those roles, but people who are desirous to serve in the way that God has given them giftings to do so, which both of those two very much and their teams would fall into that category. So those who serve the church, right, with encouragement, who remind us of true faith, the kind of people who make meals for funerals and such things like this, they are the ones that should be lifted up far more often. There are a lot of people at our church who do things without getting any sort of credit, not that we do it for credit. They run the parking at the light show. By the way, the parking at the light show, when you have, I don't know, close to 5,000 people coming in over a couple days, it takes a lot of smart people to be able to run that a couple police officers, a couple engineers. It takes some serious thinking to be able to run these things through. What I would love to elevate is the idea that service in some of these more mundane tasks, right, moving cars, doesn't require spiritual gifts. It absolutely does. We talk about people, this is uh, people working on the light show, people volunteering at Harvesters. This was a backpack campaign for uh, schools where we gave gifts to uh, backpacks filled with school goods. Uh, we have somebody in our church who uh, runs a restaurant, and so when we did the fall festival, cooked hundreds of potatoes, uh, baked potatoes, so that everybody could, and in a, again, a level of skill required to that that me, I would A, burn them all, and B, make sure that half the people didn't get fed. That would be what happened if I did that. <laughs> and all these things, those who often go unseen are worthy of special honor. So as we move now into our final passage this morning, Paul is going to basically summarize the things that he has said and give one final sort of message. He says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, right? The implicit answer there is no. Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Moreover, I will show you a better way. So he's concluding his thought here. Themes that we've already talked about. We are a body. Each one of you is a part of it. But here he's going to do something. He has endeavored to establish two ideas. One is that spiritual gifts are given by God and through his grace there is charismatic, there is charismata. Um, they are something that is from his grace. And the indiv all of them are important, and the individuals who have these gifts, right, are not deserving of any special praise unto themselves because of what they can do. But now he is going to sort of lay these two on top of each other and kind of take it one step further, and he's like, okay, if, you're, if you've been with me for what we've talked about so far, there's kind of one more lesson that we need to tackle, which is that despite the level of diversity that is present, there are certain spiritual gifts which in any church, I mean, all of them are necessary, but some of them are more important to the function of the church than others. And this is where he gets his, I don't know why that, sorry, that's what should have been up the entire time I was talking. <laughs> My bad. Forget that you saw that. You'll see it in a second. So, there is one more level, though, that he needs to go to, right? And so here's what he's saying. This is where he gets to uh, the first, second, third, fourth kind of thing. And you'll see that he puts um, different kinds of tongues at the very end because that is what the Corinthian church had been highlighting. And so he's like, let me list them all. One, two, three, four, seven. You know, it's at the very bottom, the thing that they had been lifting up. All of it goes back to how he has defined it according to verse 8, 7 or 8, where he says, what is for the common good? So here's what that looks like. Is, um, let's take teaching, for example. Across the whole church, 
we need somebody to do what I'm doing. We need somebody to teach in the children's ministry. We need people who are teaching Sunday school. Teaching uh, absolutely of the word of God needs to be a function of any church. Yet, what, right? So, okay, let me take that. So then that function of teaching needs to be held as something that is important within a church. Yet, whomever is doing that is not supposed to be prioritized over and above other people. Do you get the difference there, right? Do you get what I'm saying? That some of these spiritual gifts, that they are very important in in the carrying out of the Great Commission, right? How can people hear about Jesus if they don't hear? Yet, the individuals who are carrying forth those gifts aren't worth any special honor. And so to be very plain, I am not worthy of any special honor because of what I do over and above people who have other spiritual gifts. Yet, the role that I do and whomever stands up here, the role that they do, is important for the function and growth of our church. That's like the level two lesson that he's presenting there, okay? And that's kind of where we draw some of these things to a close. So the picture that I showed you. So this is uh, last year um, at the Academy Awards. Uh, the, there was a movie called The Eyes of Tammy Faye, and it won two Oscars. The Jessica Chastain won the Best Actress Oscar. She's the woman on the right. And the hair and makeup department won the other Oscar, okay? My eyes might be deceiving me, but the size of the Oscar is the same for both people. Yet, when you look at the poster for The Eyes of Tammy Faye, which nobody did, nobody went and saw the movie, but just envision it, (laughs) Jessica Chastain's face is on there, right? So here is where we sort of draw to a close, is that we say that the reward comes from faithfulness, not from popularity, the, the hair and makeup people were the best in their entire industry that year and what they did on that movie that nobody saw. Yet they got an Oscar. And so what was championed there is the fact that by faithfulness, they carried out their task that added to the success of this movie, which also needs actors and actresses and a director, but everybody was working together to bring these things And at the end, when God, I believe, will look at all of the work that we have done in this life, I think he is going to be far, far more concerned about the faithfulness that we showed in exercising the gifts that he gave us rather than the popularity or the supposed impact as we might determine it. I think there are some people, I think there are some out in western Kansas who are at a church of like 15 people and have done it their whole lives some pastor who has spent 40 years there pouring into that community who nobody knows the name of that is going to be lifted up far more in heaven for his exercising of spiritual gifts than other examples. The reward comes from faithfulness, not popularity. So where does that leave us? Well, as we're now in 2023, we talk a lot about um, sort of goals that we're setting. And so here would be my challenge to you is that you would endeavor to figure out what your spiritual gifts are. And you can take online tests. There's a whole lot of them. But here, here's what I would do because I, I honestly don't think that those, those online tests, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. I don't think they're exhaustive. And I don't know that you should rely on a random test in order to help you unless you would like to do that. What I would encourage you to do is go to somebody that you love and say, what gifts do you think I have? How do you think that God has gifted me? It's not a prideful question because if you're a Christian, God has gifted every single person. And so we say, how do you think that God has gifted me? And then follow up question, now how can I use that to benefit the church? And this is, I'm not trying to shill anything. I'm telling you though that your renewed diet and exercise plan and desire to read more and what, you know, change your bank account, whatever goals that you have for 2023, they're never going to be as fulfilling as exercising the purpose that God has given you by his spirit in the context that he intended, which is a really confusing way of to say that we use the spiritual gifts that God gave us in the place where he intended to give them. So, my encouragement to you, right, would be that you figure out your spiritual gifts. Yeah, you can look back at the list that we had, but really I think the question is, where has God gifted me 
Perhaps I need to ask somebody else that question. And how can I apply that to the Great Commission and to his church? That is going to be the most fulfilling thing that you do this whole year. And though as a last sort of reminder, I would draw to Paul's message to 1 Timothy when he said, don't neglect the gift that is in you. And when Paul said that to Timothy, his disciple basically, it wasn't, it wasn't a discouragement, right? It wasn't a correction to Timothy. He says, hey, Timothy, I know you. He says that the laying on of the hands of elders upon Timothy gave him um, special spiritual gifts. And he says, Timothy, I want you to use those, right? God gave it to you. I want you to use it. I want you to use it for his glory and his purposes. And, and I want you to do great things there at the church where God has planted you according to his will. And I want you to use it. Don't neglect it. I want you to use it. Man, I, I think that should rest deeply within us because there are some of us who have sort of skirted the side here. Though we've been given spiritual gifts, we haven't always used them the way that God has intended for us. So as we move now into a time of, of communion together, um, we're gonna take just like one or two minutes here and I would love for you to just kind of consider these things. I mean, how has God gifted me, right, with the charisma, with spiritual gifts. How can I use that for his church and doing all of those things reflecting on the body and blood of Jesus Christ that compels us forward in all these things? So think about that. I'll come back up in just a few moments and then we'll take the elements together. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, this is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we thank you for your body and your blood. We do these things as a remembrance of your sacrifice for us. And Father, if we believe in that, if we believe in that sacrifice, not only are we saved, not only can we live in freedom, but Lord, you have gifted us in special ways to be able to carry out your will. Father, I pray that you would help us to do that to the best of our abilities. Lord, that with faithfulness, with discernment, we might figure out how you have gifted us by your, the power of your spirit. Lord, that we would not compare ourselves to one another, but rather with faithfulness, we would say, Lord, how can I serve you? Father, please help us to do that. And God, I also pray for, it might seem odd, but Lord, I, I pray for just the, the small details. I pray that then we would be able to find ways to get connected and to make that impact, Father, that we can make the connection between what you've done for us and Lord, now what we can do for you. Father, I thank you for all these things. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ and we pray that 2023 would be a year Lord, of great blessing for everybody as we walk in the steps that you have set before us. Lord, as we desire to carry out your will to the best of our abilities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are back and we have Connor and Alan here. Hey all. Happy Hello. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Happy Year. Happy New Year. Again, to you. Yeah. Not yeah. to you, though. So Been hi. there. Done that. <laughs> Goodness, Alan. <laughs> not, great way to start the Happy first Happy New Year <laughs> to you, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, we um, are gifted by your presence. Goodness. As always. That's the end of the messages. We don't, no praise to people. I know, but we're going <laughs> to, we're grateful that you're here because I think Al and I could probably carry on a conversation about spiritual gifts, but I've never done a spiritual gifts inventory. So my conversation would be really naive. I think if I was like, just to start talking about spiritual likewise. gifts. So that's why I'm glad you're here. And it hey, would sound a lot like the first here. part of the podcast. So, yes. okay. So, since I've not done an inventory, and I imagine yeah. maybe one or two of our listeners haven't either, can you just run us through what the gifts are, the spiritual gifts? 
Oh, yeah. Well, okay. I don't have them off the top not, of my head. Not all yet. of them, but just like a... Yeah. So, okay. So, first of all, when we talk about spiritual gifts, uh, we have to talk about, right, these are all going to be things that are edifying. They build up the community um, of the church. And and so, they're not, you're not going to find things on this list that are like, you know, I'm... I'm fantastic at Scrabble, right? Or something like that. That that all of these things, even though um, some of them might be more individually oriented, they're for the common good. That was verse 7 in uh, chapter 12 that we looked at. So amongst the list of things, uh, you might talk about things like teaching. Um, well, I can go through some of the things in 1 Corinthians. Teaching, prophecy, tongues, healing, the interpretation of tongues, uh, faith, there is uh, administration. There is, um, in First Peter, they talk about the different offices. There's the office of, um, of pastor and shepherd. Uh, there are those who are uh, good at giving and helps and service and uh, mercy and hospitality. And I don't know, I probably just, I, that was at least over 10. I ran out of fingers on my hands. So, um, when we combine all four different passages in the Bible on this, you've got 1 Corinthians 12, you've got um, Romans 12, you've got, I believe it's Ephesians 4, and then 1 Peter. When we take all of these together, we're tracking at like 20. And so, um, yeah, all of them come together. But generally speaking, there are things that you would think about in the average life of the church and the activities that we do, what would be beneficial to carry out that job? And pretty much anything within that space is, um, is warranted, you know? I appreciate the way, because we've heard uh, some messages or some speakers talk about the spiritual gifts. So when I say I'm not familiar, I'm, yeah. I wasn't completely unfamiliar with them, but to, to share the context, the way you did that, that we're all important. Um, we're yeah. all, you know, yeah. there's not any one that you know, is more important than another, um, that, that it's all for Christ's glory. It's Absolutely. none of, none of us. I was shocked to find out that my knowledge of Kansas trivia wasn't a spiritual gift because that feels <laughs> like that's from God. <laughs> but seriously, um, it is when you do the youth group, uh, mission trip trivia fundraiser yes. when you're, the, <laughs> that is when you may exercise that spiritual Okay. Gift. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> that has been helpful before. Um, but I, I just appreciated the way that you presented that, and um, there's some really good takeaways from from the sermon about that that maybe people haven't considered before yeah. when they've heard about spiritual gifts. Yeah. Now, when you hear that list, there's some that like clearly. Um, what were the old Geico ads? A, a caveman could do it. Oh yeah, know? yeah, right. It's like some of these are things like helps. Just, yeah, anybody can help. Sure, but evangelism, pretty obvious. Yeah, some of those require some more skill and some of them when i hear them are even kind of like ooh, yeah like speaking in tongues i've heard right. that or the the gift of prophecy yes can you what tell us they? a yeah. little bit <laughs> so that now more about we're, those. so uh right if you've listened to the message then you know that i intentionally avoided some of this because we're about to dip our toes into the deep end here and so um I'm going to do my best to kind of give a 101 survey of sort of what, what this looks like. That is so, perfect for my skill level. Okay. So there are some of those gifts that are more miraculous than others. Healing, prophecy, speaking in tongues, um, the interpretation of tongues. Um, you know, there are, uh, there are a couple of those things there. That you recognize uh, another one that is listed in First Corinthians is just the performance of miracles, right? Okay, so obviously miraculous. Those kind of set in what sounds like a separate category than yeah, some of the things that we talked about, like like teaching or like a word of wisdom or something like that. So what has happened is that us, uh, not not me or you guys per se, but just sort of throughout history. What has been done is we've separated these gifts into two categories because we don't know what to do with the fact that um, the idea of speaking in tongues makes us a little uncomfortable today. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'll get into even that in a second. So what we've done is we've labeled those things that I mentioned, the more miraculous ones, as sign gifts. Gifts? Sign. S-I-G-H-N. 
S I G N. Thank you. Oh, okay. I, I was like, spell. G H. Cyan. Cyan gifts. Never heard of those. S I G N. Another prophecy. Uh, sign gifts, and those are uh, meaning that they are giving a sign of God's power or something like that. The difficulty is that label is not found in the Bible. Okay, so really, where somebody is getting that is going to be from uh, chapter thirteen, verse ten, um, in First Corinthians, and what. Paul says, this is the love is patient, love is kind section. But near the end, he says, um, let me catch up here. He says, for, um, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. That verse has led to no shortage of a whole lot of debate about what does it mean when the perfect comes? Mm -hmm. Because uh, specifically within the passage, what Paul is saying is there are some of these gifts, like prophesying, for instance, which is going to end when the perfect comes. And so then the question that's not answered in chapter 13 is, when is the perfect come? Is it um, the two options, two options, the two most popular options would be that Paul is saying essentially when the canon of scripture, when the New Testament was finished. And so that would mean and include all the stuff that we see in the book of Acts, uh, where the apostles are doing miracles. Paul himself, he has a handkerchief that people touch and they're miraculously healed. There's a whole lot of things going on in the early church. But once the canon of scripture was finished, once the last book was written, basically those sign gifts went away. That camp is called cessationism, that they have ceased. Okay. Right. So they would say that camp again, has made an arbitrary distinction uh, of the sign gifts over against the other ones. And they've said those gifts, those mir particularly miraculous ones, um, that not that they would deny miracles, but they're saying that those really aren't for the church today. Okay. They're going to deny that people speak in tongues, that people are, that, um, you know, somebody could be, not that God doesn't heal people, but again, that using somebody mm -hmm. as a conduit, that the spirit wouldn't do that. That's cessationism, and it's based on the idea that the perfect is the in, uh, the conclusion of the New Testament canon. The other side of that uh, is called continuationists. These people need PR teams to come up with better <laughs> titles. Continuationists. And their concept is that the, when the perfect comes, what Paul's referring to is when Jesus returns the second time. That up and until there's no more, uh, it, it is imminently obvious who God is and and uh, that he is here and present with us, that we will still, um, the spirit will still be using people to perform miraculous signs. So all those things come together. I think that the argument for cessationists is more compelling. I don't think that Paul, when he was writing, uh, A, was particularly concerned. I don't think in any of his letters he mentions uh, when the New Testament is going to be completed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was a conception for him. He was writing letters back and forth. Right. So the idea that in the middle of this letter to the Corinthians that he would be talking or alluding to somehow the canon of Scripture, uh, I don't I don't think that follows. Um, and furthermore, I don't know that you would say that the— I have a hard time with saying that the though the Bible is inerrant, that— the completion of scripture has somehow constituted the perfect. And when mm -hmm. you look at the rest of chapter 13, it just seems to be moving towards something bigger, right? That um, when the, uh, now we, he says later on in 13, he says what we see in part later on, we'll see in full. Mm -hmm. To me, that sounds like when Jesus comes. Yeah. And not to mention Paul and all of his writings, Paul had this imminent anticipation of the second coming of Christ. He says that in a lot of his letters. Yes. He's constantly talking about how Jesus is going to return. So then we're left, right? See, this is why it's the deep end, right? Now we're getting to, so then we're left with continuationists and we're left with the question, okay, so we're saying that sign gifts is sort of an arbitrary distinction that all of the spiritual gifts, everything's fair game. Yet, I don't think it's going a stretch to say that the idea of speaking in tongues today is not as comfortable of a conversation piece as it was for Paul when he was speaking to the Corinthians. Mm -hmm. And in other ways, how certain denominations have co-opted that particular gift into some really significant doctrinal statements. 
Um, so, Teresa, I don't know if this fits within your Kansas history knowledge, but Penteco- Pentecostal, the Pentecostal movement, uh, which I'm kind of separating from the charismatic movement as a general whole, but the Pentecostal movement actually got started here in Topeka, Kansas. That's amazing. Yes. And in fact, we are, what would that be, uh, 122 years almost exactly from when it got started because it was during a New Year's Eve into New Year's Day prayer celebration down at a place that was called Bethel Bible College uh, over near where um, uh, St. Mary of Most Pure Heart is Mm -hmm. right now. So the building got destroyed, but then basically that's right where it is. So downtown Topeka, Um, this guy named Charles Parham, Uh, got these people together and they prayed all night and they were contemplating the idea of what does it mean to be baptized by the spirit? Something that we talked about earlier on in first Corinthians and they prayed all night. And the conclusion that they came to on January 1st, 1901 was that the baptism of the spirit was speaking in tongues. Hmm. That's where it got started. Okay. So it really, that belief is about 120 years old. And since that time that has really led to, um, well, to be honest, I, I think a lot of misunderstanding in the church about some of these things and has then kind of given rise to even just a, an aversion towards spiritual gifts in general because of this supernatural nature that's attached to them. Um, so what do we do with that now? Well, I think that um, we should have what I'm going to say an open but cautious relationship with mm-hmm the miraculous gifts. Um, I think that just as I mentioned on Sunday, how Paul in each of those contexts that it would, the Ephesians, the Romans, the Corinthians that he was writing to them, he never uses the same list. Um, I think it's fair to say that the gift of speaking in tongues is not something that is particularly evidenced in North American churches. Though if you look around the globe, there are actually a lot of places around the world where that is a more common spiritual gift and isn't as much of a taboo as it is here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, The other thing, the other sort of qualifying remark I'd give is that the word that Paul uses for speaking in tongues, it's uh, basically glossolalia, and that's where we get the word. Right? Do you like that? I did. Makes me think of glossary. Yeah, it's kind of the Greek word glosso, right? Glosso. So that is not some kind of, it's my understanding, that it is not some kind of ecstatic, um, unintelligible prayer language that only, that that does not exist anywhere else, which Mm -hmm. is kind of how it manifests itself in more charismatic circles, some charismatic circles, is sort of this mumbling, incoherent speech. When we look at Pentecost, right, which is the greatest gifting of speaking in tongues, Mm -hmm. right, that happened in the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit was given to the community and um, everybody started speaking in tongues, what they were speaking in was another known language that they had not known previously. Okay. I've heard stories of that kind of stuff happening in other communities very often, especially with like missionary situations. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I'm like willing to, because I'm someone who's, as you kind of said, a little bit kind of, it's a little taboo to what I'm used to. Yeah. But then I hear stories of that. I'm like, okay, that makes like, I can can put a a lens on that that makes sense in my Mm -hmm. worldview, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that would be the constraint that I would put on it is that I, I don't, and there are people who would disagree with that. There are people who would disagree with a lot of things I've said, but that when we talk about some of these more miraculous things, speaking in tongues is the biggest example. And you just say, well, what was edifying for the church? And this is where Paul gets in. And I don't want to steal from future sermons here, but this is also what Paul was getting into, which is the notion that speaking in tongues is this like, eminently private thing that you just do in your home where you and you're just kind of speaking nonsense and it's your relationship with God. Okay. Well that that's not for the common good. 
Mm -hmm. And that's why Paul qualifies it later on by saying, if somebody's speaking in tongues, we need to have somebody who's interpreting mm -hmm. these tongues. Because ultimately, what's hap what's important is not the fact that they can speak in another language. It's what, what they're they saying, saying yeah. in that language mm -hmm. that's beneficial to the church. And in other contexts, like in Pentecost, how is the message of the gospel being proclaimed to somebody in a new language? Mm -hmm. um, briefly, when we look at the other quote-unquote sign gifts, I think that we just have to use, again, that phrase that we are open but cautious. Prophecy but, is one of those? Okay. Yeah. So Prophecy is a dicey one, um, partly because if more than speaking in tongues, whether you are a cessationist or continuationist, your definition of what prophecy looks like mm -hmm. changes. If you're a cessationist, you want to bring that into the camp of things that um, either happened previously and is miraculous in its own right because you're a cessationist mm -hmm. and it's not happening today. Or if you put that into the category of it happening today, you're going to sort of, you know, they'll I don't want to say make it mundane, but it'll be like, hey, it's a word of power uh, that seems to speak into somebody's life mm -hmm. and is really meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm okay with the notion of there still being a level of miraculous prophecy today, but I can't think of many good examples where I've ever seen it done. Can I, can I well, say that? Like, I, I don't think, you know, somebody saying like, to give an example, like when somebody's like, Jesus is going to return in, you know, 2024 or, you know, um, that the, the, they're saying that God is telling them that the stock market is going to crash or how televangelists have abused, you know, uh, frankly, a lot of these spiritual mm -hmm. gifts, healing, speaking in tongues, prophecy, yeah. uh, to, uh, bilk people out of their money. I don't want to give a bunch of examples of some that I can think of. You know what I mean? We'll have somebody saying like, oh, this is a person right now who's doing prophecy well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only personal anecdote I can give is that I have been in some circles where I think that there was a lot of spiritual warfare going on in ministry, and I have found some people having a I'm going to say as a preternatural sort of an uncanny hunch about something that should be done or a way that they felt that something should go. Or like I've heard about, I've heard this at TBC actually too, but they go up to somebody and it's like, Hey, I really feel like I should be praying for you in this specific regard. And mm -hmm. that person is like, that is exactly what I needed. Those are the channels that I, I, I would really like it to stay in. But you, you nailed it. it. The thing that's important there is if that is prophecy, it is about what is the good that's going to come from that and not about looking to the person who said it yeah. and glorifying them. It's, yeah. it's about what God wants for the betterment of the community. Yeah, I'd take it far that. away from the apocalyptic language mm -hmm. and I would take it far away from the Old Testament prophet language where they were speaking about, you know, the nation of Israel or something like mm -hmm. that. Well, yeah, it just gets really scary where a lot of the big times where someone had the gift of prophecy, it actually took the church in a new direction and sometimes created a whole new religion. Yeah. Like, I mean, Islam would kind of be an example, Mormonism, yeah, things yeah, like Joseph that. Yeah, Smith, that's a really good example. It'd be yes. like, that's what they would have said is like, yeah. this person is a prophet. Yes, that's exactly You're right. going to follow what he says and then it actually takes them away from the truth. Wow. Yeah. Good, good point. This brings up another spiritual gift, which is the discernment of spirits, mm -hmm. right? You know, and so all of these things that we're supposed to test, the Bible talks about that quite a bit that, you know, just because somebody uses the name of Jesus doesn't mean that it is supposed to be trusted. And right. So it's a, it's a whole <laughs> it's big scary. thing. It's, it's a whole big thing. Yeah. You know, it can be a minefield. It can. And I, and I think, you know, what's beneficial for us is we just have to say, you know, we never want to make the claim that, um, uh, God is limited or that God is not still doing miracles today. Mm -hmm. And so I think in order to preserve the notion that, um, A, that I think that the continuationist argument is uh, a higher quality, B, the fact that I think that miracles still happen today, and I think I have heard and seen examples of that, and C, 
that what is clear to me, and this is not often brought up, but what is clear to me in 1 Corinthians is that Paul is speaking to the church about the spiritual gift of tongues as an example, but that's the one that was relevant to them in a manner that is only rebuking them for the way that they lifted it and prioritized it, not that they should stop doing it entirely. Mm -hmm. I think that that is really relevant for how we talk about stuff for today. Um, And so, you know, all that being said, the practical thing, somebody says, well, Connor, what if somebody said, hey, I can speak in tongues. Can I, you know, come up to the church? Um. Maybe. That's very interesting because yeah. there's from time to time we have people who are new to the church who've reached out to us through our online, you know, plan a visit platform. And, you know, one of the first things they want to share with us is that they have one of those gifts and they want to make sure that they yeah. they'll be heard and you know, it's just a very interesting And, and I can't say that every single time that that happens that that person is always in the the best. Yeah. Um, has the best of intentions yeah. or maybe they have good intentions, but perhaps they are um, not exactly clear on what, right. uh, what it is they're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, go yeah. ahead. So one of the biggest things for me, when you talk about spiritual gifts is that I'd never taken a test to oh, yeah. know what yeah. mine would be. Uh, if that's one or more, however, that kind of tends is to super happen. producing a spiritual gift. Yeah, is that, is that, well, <laughs> So do you find that it would be important for me to know it or is it okay that I'm kind of going through life just doing what I can to help in whatever situation? Yeah. Whatever kind of comes to me naturally rather than knowing specifically like, oh, this is a, this type of task. This is a job for Alan Hardy. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> so what's your thoughts? That's a great question. Um, so I kind of wish Jason was here for the one reason is that I'm going to compare this to my... um angst with the Enneagram. <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know, I'm not a fan of the Enneagram. I I think the Enneagram is, um, and I'm also going to tell you what Jason would say here because I know he's going to listen to this later. And um, Jason would tell me that I'm an Enneagram 5. And Enneagram 5s are, amongst other things, they are self-reflective. And so they are able to, you know, be discerning. So I have often looked at tests like the Enneagram as unnecessary because I'm like, who needs to be told that they enjoy good friends and they get frustrated when people, you know, are mean to them and things like that. I think there's a level of analogy there with spiritual gift tests. I think that if you are somebody who um, struggles with being self-discerning and understanding you know, how God might have gifted you and where you think your talents are, I think that those can be really beneficial. Um, And I wouldn't hold umbrage against anybody who took those tests. I've taken those tests before. Um, But really what they're going to do is they're going to say, like, for instance, if they're fishing, if you have the spiritual gift of teaching, do you enjoy teaching? Do you feel like when you teach that you're particularly skilled at it? And then they'll ask that question six different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, do you enjoy standing up in front of people and giving information and explaining things, that kind of stuff. Right. Right. And so I think with just self-reflection, you can discover a lot of those things. And this is where I get into why I feel like it might not be, I feel like I was just really discouraging to a bunch of people who like the Enneagram, (laughs) which isn't my intention. (laughs) My whole purpose was to explain that. And Jason would say, of course, that is what a five would say. That's what a five would say. That's what a five would say. (laughs) So, so back to spiritual gifts and to answer your question, Alan. So here's what I would not advise is thinking that all spiritual gifts must be listed within that Mm -hmm. box, right? I think that what Paul was doing was he was looking at somebody, he was looking at a community and he would say, Hey, this is what I'm seeing there. Like, okay, let's, let's think like if we just talked about TBC, what are some of the spiritual gifts that you think are evidenced within our community? Mm -hmm. Right. I would say generosity would be an amazing spiritual gift. That's a spiritual gift. I would say the gift of service, Mm -hmm. right? That is a a huge spiritual gift. I think that we have a lot of really good teachers within our community and we love to teach the Bible. You know, I mean, so you look at your context and you say, Hey, these are the things that I see. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Alan, 
What do you think? Yes, that is you. What do you think that you are gifted at, man? Uh, I like to do a lot of like behind the scenes stuff, not necessarily in the limelight. Yeah. And can kind of um, spread or, or kind of like assist people like you or whoever else would be in front of the camera to deliver their message yeah. uh, for the common good, I guess, as we've been yeah. using that term. So if there's like a spiritual gift that kind of would be a part of that where it's like, I'm down to assist you and do what I know how to do, which is a lot of the technical aspects. So yeah. what can I, what can I do for other people? So to what help do them you spread feel out of that? Okay. So now we've established, okay, this is the lane that I like to run in. This is the sort of job that I like to do. Mm -hmm. I don't love being at the front of the crowd, but I like pushing the crowd from behind and moving it forward and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So now within that scope of things, where do you think you are particularly skilled? Uh, in kind of maybe f helping them flesh out the story that they that. want yeah. to tell and kind of can assist and just know how to make it happen rather than just be an idea. Yeah, sure. What else? And, and you're really good at counseling people and how they should position themselves or, you know, using, using the tools here to, to really yeah, make someone maybe get look more their best. into the specifics and how, um, what someone wants to say can be said better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you're really detail oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think you have a great ability to uh, set a vision for the kind of product that you would like to see the end goal for it. You've done that here with the podcast. You've done right. it with our social media things. You've done it with uh, different videos that we've produced. Right. Mm -hmm. I think you have an artist's eye. You know, I think of some of the editing <laughs> that you've done. Well, I mean, I think of the editing that you've done and some of the, people who aren't in the video AV realm don't understand the level of skill that it takes to be able to produce a video well mm -hmm. and do it with the right lighting and angles and content and, um, you know, sort of cutting and things like that. Um, I think that you are, um, uh, you're very generous in the way that you're very flexible. You're very, I mean, I, I could keep going on and on, Teresa. Your instincts. That was one. Oh, that's a good yeah, one. Like, I well, feel like we're having your performance review right well, now. If it says anything about <laughs> my, my spiritual gifts, it's like this right now is very uncomfortable for me. Okay, just well, there being you like, go. You're like this and this and this, and <laughs> well, you're I'm sorry. great. And I'm just like, oh, okay, all right. So, I got a lot of live up to I'll, here. <laughs> I'll quit. I, I you don't, don't have to live up to it because you do it. It's oh, just natural for you. It's your gifting. I didn't mean to embarrass you. No, all, it's just it's just a. All I'm trying to say though is that I think that there's a difference between here's what I like to do. And then within that scope of things, here is what I seem to be oddly good at. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily in comparison to other people, but usually within that space of the things that you find that you are oddly good at or have a, an innate passion for, right? Then you find, you already said it, you find a lot of fulfillment in carrying out those things and specifically when you can apply them to the church. So to give you a quick example for myself, what this looks like is... When I, so I think I have a spiritual gift of teaching, right? So um, when I do that, when I teach, I feel much more fulfilled than when I might be doing something else that is good and is for the church, like um, uh, if I am looking at <laughs> um, giving reports, or something like that and working with the budget nitty okay. gritty stuff the nitty gritty stuff things that doug will mm -hmm. certainly has a spiritual gift yes. for so those things are good they're for the common good they're for the church um i don't really love doing them and so just because i'm doing them for the common good doesn't mean it's my spiritual gift mm -hmm. and i also though i might have some skill in them i don't think that's really where i'm best utilized mm -hmm. so i don't know if this is helping you in this stuff like you can take a test that says you have X, Y, Z gift and they'll usually rank them for you. And so maybe that's a good place for you to start out. But no matter if you take that test or if you don't, you're still going to need to say at some point, okay, well, it says I have the gift of service. What does that really mean here? And how can I then equip the church? How can I use those things, right? That, that is the space that I wanted to get into on Sunday is sort of shortcutting around this idea of what are my gifts and straight from I have gifts to 
The purpose is then to use them for the local church yeah. and to benefit. And then I find joy and fulfillment when I do that and I find those avenues. Right? Yeah, and it kind of even skirts past the potential pride that you might feel when you have a certain gift. Mm-hmm. If you jump right into the idea of how can I use this gift to help others, Yeah, I feel like you get away from patting yourself on the back. Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's false humility to to just continually neglect what other people see in you or what they say about you or where you even feel like the Lord has blessed you. I don't really think that's true humility to just, if you, for instance, Alan were to just be like, Oh no, I'm not good at what I do or my job. Please don't say that. I think it's much better to say, well, thank you. You know? And then whether to that person or to yourself, you know, it's just like, man, glory be to God. Yeah. I I can share, you know, that I've walked through this at, and Jim and anybody else has spoke has said the same things. There are lots of people who come up and say, good job yeah. right after Sunday. And I think it's a continual process of reminding that I have to go through because it's like, and I started out, I'll be honest with you. When I started out, I think to almost every single person, I would try and include the phrase like, well, glory be to God, like just deflect it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But a, that's not really fulfilling to that person who is trying to give a compliment. Uh, but also B, I think I am able to, at this point, I'm much better at understanding just instantly, hey, whatever it is, I have been, I have certainly felt the experience of what it's like when I'm trying to teach and I have not, I don't know what I want to say here. I don't want to be hyper spiritual, but had the spirit using me, Mm -hmm. I've definitely had some low moments and I know what it's like. And so I'm easily able to say, hey, glory be to God, if that is edifying to anybody, Mm -hmm. it's not me. It's him. And I think if we're able to view our skills from that perspective, it really rounds out any sense of pride that we have because we haven't even considered, oh, I did this myself. It moves instantly from God gave it to me to now God is using it to benefit his church. Mm -hmm. And I am simply a vessel. Mm -hmm. You're a vessel. Teresa's a vessel. We're all vessels. Yeah, I think I've even heard that be said at like a pre-sermon prayer, like worship just ended, pastor gets on stage, he prays immediately. And that's like a phrase that they'll use is like, don't let them see me, let them see God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if they have like a gift of teaching, it kind of, that's, that's not, that's different than the anti-humility or whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. That's just kind of saying, use me. Yeah. And there's a heart behind it for everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that spiritual, and the, actually, if I could say one last thing, this is just really quick, but I would reinforce the point, though, that having, perceiving that you don't have a spiritual gift does not preclude you from doing activities which every Christian should well be said. doing. Well said. You know? Yeah. yeah. So I think that that is relevant. There's no get out of. Everybody should be sharing the gospel with other people. <laughs> yeah, everybody yep. should do it. Even if it's not our strength if it's not yeah. what we feel like is our gifting we still I mean, it's the great commission to do this so yeah yeah it yeah. makes me think of like harvesters which we do every month yeah there's a wide range of people who are doing that and yeah. and some are better at it than others but it doesn't mean the people who right maybe can't pick up things as easily sh- don't shouldn't be there there's you a know place for all abilities and yeah yeah, yeah. Well, and then there's also just to what i said you know there's also to some measure like as a staff we go to harvesters and I mean, I can't say that every time I've been there and it's raining or snowing that I'm just like having the time of my life, right. but there's a certain level where you're like, eh, well, this is what we should be doing, mm-hmm. you know? And so all things come together for the good of the God's kingdom. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, we pray that this podcast has been edifying to you. And if so, it's because God made it so. <laughs> yeah. You should figure out your spiritual gifts and use them for the church if you have a spiritual gifts assessment that you really like oh that's a good email idea. me teresa with one no that, h at discover does not require a paywall please no payments or even a lot of them you have to put in your personal information to get yeah an we, we want it to be easy and we don't want to get emails afterward <laughs> because of it so email me and we'll take a look at it there and we go. maybe even share it on the next episode all right happy new year have happy a great week Thank you for listening to the TBC Extra Podcast. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. We drop an episode every Wednesday, and on the first Friday of each month, we have an extra episode. Extra, extra! 
with stories, pastoral teaching, interviews, and more. See you next time and have a great rest of your week.